we just finished talking about the complement system and I made the point that even though complement and antibody are both parts of humoral immunity, antibodies are not complement, okay? Not complement. <clears throat> Let's move on to the organs that are a part of our immune system analogy. Uh, immune cells are going to be the soldiers in this metaphor. <clears throat> And these soldiers need to come from somewhere. All of the cells that we're going to be talking about, even some of the cells we're not talking about, like eosinophils and basophils, all of them are made inside of the bone marrow, specifically in the red marrow. Remember when you were learning the parts of a bone and you learned that there was spongy bone and compact bone, <clears throat> And in the spongy bone, there are little spaces between the bone, and in those spaces lives something called red marrow, or we often just refer to it as bone marrow. Red marrow is where all of your immune system cells come from, every one of them. Uh, they are all born in the bone marrow. Now, when the cells pop out of the bone marrow, almost all of them are ready to go. They're ready to get sent out to wherever they're going to be fighting the war. Neutrophils, ready to go. Eosinophils, ready to go. Basophils, ready to go. Monocytes, they're ready to go. They'll turn into something else when they leave the blood vessels. There's, there are lymphocytes called NK cells. They're ready to go. There are lymphocytes called T lymphocytes, not ready to go. Uh, B lymphocytes are ready to go. The T lymphocytes, they need to spend more time in the thymus, okay? So the thymus. The thymus is the organ that will produce T lymphocytes or T cells. Clearly, there's a good reason to call T lymphocytes T cells. It's a whole lot easier to say. Lymphocytes are really big when you're a baby. I mean, the thymus is very big when you're a baby. Look at how big that thymus is. Holy cow. It's pretty much as big as one of that kid's lungs. The thymus is a really large organ. And from the time you're a baby until you're about 12 years old, your immune system is developing and growing and learning what's safe and learning what's not safe and uh, your immune system is evolving. Uh, once you get to be about 12, 13, 14, then your thymus starts getting smaller. So by the time you're your age, you've probably got a little shriveled up thymus left over. I want you to remember that T lymphocytes, also called T cells, they mature in the thymus. That's why they're called T cells, T for thymus. So those were our military bases at home on planet Earth, because that's where our soldiers come from. Where do our soldiers get stationed? Well, they get stationed in a couple of places. We're really only going to be talking about lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are kind of like military outposts. And these military outposts are filtering through lymph. This is important, lymph nodes they are the only organs that filter lymph. What do we mean by filtering lymph? You know, filtering lymph is not exactly my best choice of words. Uh, that's the way it's always described. I don't like it so much. Because when I think of filter, I think of like little particles going through a filter and getting trapped on one side. And that's really not what's going on. Here's what is going on. That stuff that's called lymph, remember lymph? That stuff called lymph is traveling, let's try orange. That stuff called lymph has been moseying from wherever it was uh, released up through um, the lymphatic vessels. And it's going to get here and it is going to kind of mosey its way on through this organ called the lymph node. Now, why? <clears throat> well, what you can't see on here is all of these areas that I'm going to circle in, I'm gonna circle them in blue. All of these areas that I'm going to circle in blue 
all of these areas, they contain lots and lots of lymphocytes. Even here in this area, there are quite a number of lymphocytes. There are individual cells whose job it is to basically examine all of the molecules that's in this liquid lymph that is flowing through the lymph node. And I very often think of a lymph node as kind of like being one of those TSA checkpoints at the airport, right? As, as you're going from the entrance of the airport to your gate where you're gonna get on the plane, you have to go through these TSA checkpoints. So if anything wants to get from your toe and end up going back to your bloodstream, it's got to pass through all of these TSA agents. And those cells, mostly T cells and B cells, but also dendritic cells, they're busy investigating what's going on there. Right? There are lots of small uh, um, lymphatic vessels that are bringing fluid into the lymph node and not very many lymphatic vessels leaving the lymph node. And that allows the fluid to spend a lot of time in the lymph node so that the B cells and the T cells have plenty of time to investigate what's going on there. Now, why is this an advantage? So the, one of the problems with the human body is it's so big. Remember, we're like 10 trillion cells big. We are enormous. We have got this amazing thing. We have got this uh, immune system and the immune system is able to fix things, but how does the immune system even know that there's a problem? Let's imagine you were barefoot in your backyard and you stepped on something sharp and now you've got a little cut on your toe. How does your immune system know that there is some bacteria in your toe? Well, actually, that's a little bit more of a complicated system than we'll be able to explore completely in one lecture. But one of the ways it will know is that the bacteria that get into your toe, they make molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, and other things that are never made by the human body, ever. And those molecules will get dissolved into that fluid called lymph, and then that fluid called lymph is going to mosey its way up through the lymphatic vessels. And as it mosey its way up through the lymphatic vessel, it's going to end up going through a lymph node. Once it goes through a lymph node, those cells in the lymph node, they'll be like, I don't know, they'll be gossiping with each other. Hey, Charlie, did you see the latest episode of Witcher or something like that? And then they'll go, oh my gosh, Look what I got here. This is a bacterial molecule. Oh, we've got to tell all of the soldiers that there must be an infection down there at the end of this particular lymphatic vessel. And they will organize themselves and they will send out immune system to tackle the problem. So why can't we do this with blood? Well, the reason we can't do it with blood is blood is moving super fast. How fast is blood moving? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do blood with the color blue, okay? Blood is going to go from here, down your aorta, down to the toe, back up here, back to your heart, out to your lungs, back to here, about once every minute. Every little drop of blood is making that whole pathway once every minute. There ain't time to be investigating whether there's bacterial proteins in it or not. No time, okay? But how about lymph? Lymph is traveling really, really slowly. Any given drop of lymph is going to go from here up to your heart, not in a minute, maybe like in an hour. So there's a lot more time for all of those cells to kind of look at everything and check it out. So. Lymph, lymph nodes, now you know why they end up in the same chapter. Then we've got this issue of never letting mon monkeys eat bananas. This is not pet care advice, even though I am a veterinarian. This is a way for you to remember what is the most numerous white blood cell and what is the least numerous white blood cell, okay? What's more abundant than any of these white blood cells? Red blood cells and platelets. 
We're not even thinking about them. We're just thinking about the white blood cells. Remember, white blood cells are also called leukocytes, L-E-U-K-O-C-Y-T-E-S, leukocytes. And the most abundant of the leukocytes is the neutrophils and for never. Then the lymphocytes, L for let. Then the monocytes, M for monkey. Then the eosinophils, E for eat. And then the banana basophils, B for banana. So if I ask you, what is the second most abundant of the white blood cells? And by abundant, I mean, if we just count all of your white blood cells, we've got the most of neutrophils, the next most of lymphocytes. The answer would be lymphocytes. And these are all of our different soldiers. Let's talk a little bit about neutrophils. Neutrophils are my favorite white blood cells. And one of the reasons is that the protein that I discovered, it is used by neutrophils to kill bacteria and to protect you. That's one of the reasons that I like them. Another reason that I like them is they are the most numerous of your white blood cells. They will do 80 to 90% of keeping you alive. And yet they get very little respect in terms of research into the immune system. So they're kind of underdogs and I like that about them. What is their number one job? The number one job of neutrophils is to kill bacteria. That's their number one job. How do they do it? There are two ways that neutrophils are going to kill bacteria. Ah, here are our neutrophils. Where are you? There is a beautiful neutrophil with your weird little nucleus. One way that they do it is by eating bacteria. And we don't say eating bacteria. We see phagocytizing or phagocytosing, either one. And they phagocytize the bacteria. They eat it. And once they eat it, it's trapped in like a little jail cell inside. And they take a granule, maybe with some of my protein, throw it in there and ah, it all dies, okay? Now, here's something that's important. Since neutrophils are designed to kill bacteria, when you've got a bacterial infection, like let's imagine you've got a bacterial pneumonia, let's imagine that, or you've got a really bad infection of your foot. If I take a sample of your blood, I will notice that because you've got a bad bacterial infection, your bone marrow has been making more neutrophils and kicking them out into your bloodstream. So if you've ever gone to a doctor and the doctor says, oh, I don't think your cough needs antibiotics. Here, I'll do a blood test to check. <clears throat> what are they checking? If your cough does need antibiotics, you will have a larger than normal number of neutrophils. And now you'll know that. most dramatically increase during the bacterial infections. So there are two ways, I said, that bacteria <clears throat> will be killed by these neutrophils. One is if the neutrophil eats them. The other is they can create a killing zone. So let's imagine one poor little neutrophil is surrounded by so many bacteria that he knows he can't eat them all. He's just going to go out in style. He's going to take all of his granules and throw all of those granules filled with poison outside of his little neutrophil body and kill every bacteria that is surrounding him. That is called degranulation, and it happens in a respiratory burst. And so they go down fighting little kamikaze cells. I like neutrophils. All right, we're going to stop there. And we, oh, how do they distinguish self from non-self? There's a third reason why neutrophils are my favorite white blood cells. Neutrophils not only do 80 to 90% of keeping you from dying, but they never cause you problems. You know, um, the rest of the cells we were talking about, they can make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, you will get a problem, an autoimmune disease like type 1 diabetes. These guys don't do it. And the reason is that they are designed, they have been born with a list of things that they will kill. If you see this molecule on the surface, kill it. If you see this molecule on the surface, kill that. 
And they are programmed with a list of molecules that will distinguish that the cell that they are looking at is not human. And that list is so perfectly designed that they just do not kill things that are human cells. So that is another reason why they're my favorite.